Hello everyone, my name is Romain. It's my pleasure to be here with you today, although virtually, to tell you a few bits and pieces about IoT Bench, which is a, an initiative I've been involved uh, for the benchmarking of wireless communication protocols. And in particular, I would like to stress some of the particular reproducibility challenges we have been faced across the, the spectrum of this work. So uh, this is me, uh, the cheap attempt to make this presentation a bit more human feeling. So I would like to start off by asking you a very simple question. Think whether or not you have ever performed an experimental evaluation of whatever you might be working on. Software system, a hardware design, a protocol evaluation, whatever it is. Given uh, the audience that I expect to be from the cross symposium, uh, I would say the answer is most likely yes. And then the follow-up question is, how confident are you that if you were to run again the same evaluation, you will find the same results? It's not so easy, isn't it? And you should not feel too bad about this. You're actually not alone in this. Uh, some years ago, researchers were surveyed and asked whether they think there is something of a reproducibility crisis in their field, and a very large majority of them said that there was indeed a problem with reproducibility irrespectively of their field. So why is that? Why is reproducibility so hard? My main takeaway for you today is that reproducibility is intrinsically linked to being able to have quanti quantifiable confidence in some performance results. In particular, it is not possible to have reproducibility without quantifiable confidence. In my PhD studies, which I completed last year, I was working in wireless communication protocols. One of the problems we face regarding to reproducibility in this context is external interference. This is the reason why, as you can see on this picture, uh, we sometimes do our experiments within an anechoic chamber so that we can shield ourselves for, from external noise and thereby trying to enhance the reproducibility of our setup. If we don't do this, well, actually, uh, we have to face the real life of uh, the RF noise, the radio frequency noise. You can see here a short video I made some time ago of uh, a power analysis. Uh, the takeaway is that things move very quickly over, over the frequency space or the time axis. It's beyond our control. It's a huge mess. And this is really problematic because when you're faced with uh, this very common question is how does your whatever compare with the state of the art, what you want to be able to do is to run your system against some sort of benchmark. And so we came to the same conclusion. It's okay, we need a benchmark for our protocol we use in IoT devices. And because we're very inventive, we call that IoT Bench. So what is the vision behind IoT Bench? What is it we are trying to achieve here? So the idea is as follows. Let's say you've been designing your cutting edge uh, communication protocol and you want to see how well it performs and how, by how much it beats the, the other approaches. At least that's what you hope for. Our idea is that you would send your binary file with containing your code to IoT Bench. They will take care of uh, automatically run your binary against some uh, benchmarking scenarios. And then you will re receive those results back uh, so that you can put in your plot for your next paper. We will also store your binary so that we can repeat uh, automatically evaluating your protocol over time. We will store this evaluation results of your and other protocols so that we can eventually and finally compare different protocols against each other and have some sort of, of uh, reproducible evaluations. So here, the comparison of the results is really what we are interested in. That's really the end game as far as the benchmarking initiative is concerned. There are, of course, uh, uh, quite a handful of challenges there. The first, first issue we face is that uh, typically researchers use a very wide range of settings for their experiments. Uh, here you see only three dimensions, which are the time interval uh, between packets, the number of devices we use to test our protocols, and the number of runs that each paper reports. And you can see that 
the data is all over the place. Like no one is, no two people are doing things in the same way. So that makes it very difficult to eventually compare their results. Furthermore, the papers themselves are not meant to be reproducible artifacts. Like they don't provide often enough, uh, in, you know, they don't provide enough information in order to be able to uh, rerun the experimental campaign should you, should you wish to do that. And finally, uh, it's often the case that you do not have the, the, the reference results. You, don't, you have the result from the paper, but you cannot rerun the, co the, the code of the protocol because it might just not be available or the experimental setup is not available anymore. So how do we want to address this? There's a handful of things one can do. And in this talk today, the two aspects I would like to focus on relates to the methodology and in particular how to uh, design the experiment and how to compare results with one another. So again, main takeaway of my talk, we cannot have reproducibility without quantifiable confidence. So essentially we have shifted the question of reproducibility towards how do we get quantifiable confidence? To do this, we have, uh, I would like to propose a three-step approach. First and foremost, we need to understand the type of variability we are faced with. Once we know the source of variability, we can use the right statistical method to handle them. And then finally, we can put all that together so that we can um, provide confident claims. So let's start off with the variability. What does uh, reproducibility mean? Right? What we are saying informally is that an experiment is reproducible if you can obtain the same result under the same conditions. As I mentioned, with uh, RF environment, it's a bit difficult to obtain the same condition, almost essentially impossible. So we know we expect performance variability. We will never obtain the exact same results. And this this uh, problem is not peculiar to wireless communication. It happens also in tons of other, actually most of other experimental research. So what type of variability, right? We know we expect some, but how does it look? So let's take a time axis of experiment and see what are we are essentially doing. Let's say we measure some quantity X, which can be anything you're interested in over time, and you observe some variations like this. What you would do typically at the end of your run is that you will aggregate this information by computing some kind of metric, for example, the mean. But of course, you don't, you're not going to do this only once. You will do that a handful of times, which we call the series. And for every run, you will obtain one value of your metric. So now you need to summarize data one step further. And this is often done by using what is known as KPI. That stands for Key Performance Indicator, where you would compute against some kind of aggregate of your metric values. Could be the median, could be, again, the mean. Doesn't really matter. But then. It doesn't actually stop there. Like if you take this series of run and you repeat it one month from now or even one year from now, chances are very good that you will not obtain the exact same KPI value. So the value of X varies. This is why we compute the metric, but the metric can vary and the KPI computed based on the metrics will also vary over a longer period of times. And those are three different scales uh, of variability that are experimental design has to handle with. So how do we do this, right? The goal is that each of those, of, of those uh, values should be robust estimates. What does that mean? It means that it should be able to tell me how many runs I should have in a series. And we have actually other questions that are related to this that are how long the run should be, how long the time span of a series should be, and how many, how many series I should perform. And the overall objective of the experimental methodology is to find a rational answer to these questions, right? Obviously, if we take how many runs, one run is not enough, a million runs is most probably too much. So what is the right trade-off in between? And what our goal is really to try to quantify this trade-off between the amount of effort we put in our experiments with the resulting confidence we're gonna have in uh, the numerical values. And to do this, we need to resort to the appropriate statistics to handle the different variability that we may face. So I will focus in the, in the rest of this talk on the second question, how many runs uh, should we have in a series? What does that mean? Why are we trying to answer this? Or actually, more precisely, what are we doing when we try to answer this? 
What we're saying is that the KPI, the value we compute based on the series of run, should keep reasonably the same values if a bit more or a bit less of the runs were performed. So effectively what we are doing is that we, we based on a few runs, because we cannot run infinitely many, we are trying to estimate the KPI value, let's say the median for the sake of argument, of the underlying distribution of the metrics. So this distribution we don't know, we are trying to estimate it based on the samples and more precisely we're interested in one statistics from that distribution. This is the, the underlying process that we are trying to fulfill here. How to do this properly? One way of doing this is to use what is known as confidence interval, which informally stands for a numerical interval in, in which the true value of something lies with a certain probability, which we call, which is known as the confidence level. So on the right side, you can see an example. If I say that AB is a 95% confidence interval for the median of some quantity X, it means that the probability that the true median of X, which I don't know, is within A and B um, with a probability larger uh, or equal to 95%. Now, which KPI should we use? Often enough, uh, in, in the literature, you will see use the mean and the standard deviation uh, as information for the central tendency and the spread of our distributions. And this is often enough because use as we have this picture in mind. The problem is that this works only if you know that the underlying distribution of your matrix data is normal. And I'm sorry to tell you that, but in 99.9999% of the cases, this will not hold true. In computer science, most of the experimental data we have is not normally distributed. So we have to resort to what is known as non-parametric statistics. That is, method that do not make any assumption on the nature of the underlying distribution. Consequently, one should not use mean and standard deviation because somehow they don't really help us uh, arguing about the overall distribution. Instead, uh, what we recommend in our, in our work has been to use percentiles as KPI. The reason we, we recommend this is that it actually exists rather a simple non-parametric method to compute confidence interval uh, for, the, for the percentiles. Here is an intuition on how this works. Let's say we are interested in estimating the location of the median of this quantity x, and we take one sample, just one. What is the probability that the median is above this sample or is below that sample? By definition of the median, it's going to be one half on each side. Now, say we take a second sample independently of the first one. Then the probability multiplies, and it is the, the median is pro, is below both samples with probably one half times one half equal one quarter. Same on if it's above both, and in the middle it's going to be one of each, so probability one half again. We can repeat this process with three samples, four samples, and as many samples as you want. And essentially, you can show that the probability of any percentile P of P to lie between two successive samples follow a well-known uh, distribution, which happens to be the binomial distribution in this case. And you can play a bit with the math so that you use this to compute confidence interval for any percentile you're in interested in. The nice thing about this, uh, this method is that you can actually revert it to get the minimal number of samples n you need to make any estimation at any confidence level. For example, if I stick with a 95% confidence interval, if I'm interested in estimating the median, I need only six samples, which is rather okay. Now, if I want the quartile and increases to 11, if I want the 95th percentile or the first percentile, this increases already to 300. And then if some of you are familiar with industry standards, we often talk about, or you hear about those 5-9 uh, level of reliability. So if we plug in the math, it means that we need about 300,000 samples in order to get a 95% um, confidence interval for this percentile. So yeah, pretty much we can forget about it. Uh, more visually, here's how this looks like when you start adding uh, more and more samples to your set. So once you do one, two, three, four, five samples, you still don't have enough. 
then you, you reach six samples, which, as we saw just before, is the minimal number of samples you need to get 95% confident interval. So you, in other words, you know that between the minimal and the maximal of your samples, the probability of the true median to lay in that interval is larger than 95%. And then as we add more and more samples, we're going to start being able to exclude extramal values from our estimate interval. And this will go on and on and on, and eventually, as intuitively expected, the more samples you have, the narrower your confidence will, will tend to get. All right, so this is how, this is an example of using the proper statistics for the intended purpose. Now, finally, we need to glue all those things together. How does that help me? How do I use this knowledge to help me design and analyze the data that are coming out of my experiment so that I can eventually reach reproducibility or improve on my reproducibility at least. For that, we'll work on a framework which we ended up calling TriScale to precisely help you doing this. So we reuse the three time scales that we have seen earlier uh, with runs, series, and sequels. For each of those, we have two different pipelines, one for design, one for the analysis. In the design pipeline, you find the questions we had before. And for example, for the series, how many runs do we need in order to reach the confidence we're interested in? And what we put in this pipeline, in this design pipeline, are uh, the evaluation objectives. What parameters are we trying to, interest, to estimate? What metrics, which KPI, which confidence level do we want to achieve? You run through the pipeline and then you get um, the essentially the description of how much effort you should put into your experiments, how many times you should repeat your experiments, essentially. Once you have this, you can perform your data collection, which is beyond the scope of the framework. And once you have the data, you can pipe it through the analysis pipeline, which will take care of running the appropriate statistics to compute the metrics, the KPI, and what we call the variability scores uh, in the end. And we'll give you this uh, performance report, which um, is associated with quantifiable uh, confidence level, and therefore uh, significantly raises the bar on the reproducibility of those results. Practically speaking, TriScale is a Python module uh, that you can uh, use. It contains, as I mentioned, all the implementation of all the statistical methods you need, as well as some visualization to help you in the process and understand what's going on with your data. If you're interested for more detail, it's actually much more, uh, there are many more things that I just uh, have the chance to tell you in a few minutes. I, I invite you to check the paper. Uh, the code is already openly available. It is still anonymous as this work is under submission. Uh, there is even a live, de live demo on GitHub, so you can just click a link and go and have a look at the, the functions and how they work within a Jupyter Notebook without having to install anything. So really to summarize, the goal of this entire process is to move away from making bare performance claims, simple claims without really foundations, to scientific claims where we have grounds to say, those are the results I have, and this is the level of confidence I expect should you um, try to reproduce my experiments. So again, reproducibility is intrinsically linked to quantifiable confidence. And more precisely, there is no chance of getting reproducibility if you cannot quantify the confidence in your results. That's my main message for you today. And so then the question is, how do we get to this, uh, to this quantifiable confidence? argue that you need to understand which source of variability you have in your system, use the appropriate statistical method in, in order to uh, compensate for this variability, and finally put that together to make robust claims. This is a work uh, that I haven't done on my own, so I would like to acknowledge some of my collaborators here. And if you should be more interested, you will already find the slides uh, of this presentation online, as well as the TriScale paper, as I mentioned.